Peace to everybody tuning in via Facebook and YouTube. My name is Brother Cephas. My partner today is <laughs> Brother Justin. Today we're gonna we're not necessarily going to do a class. It's more of a discussion. And we're going to uh, discuss various topics. And today the three of them is going to be Easter, Passover, and the New Year. <clears throat> And I just thought about this too, but it sort of incorporates with Easter. We're also going to address Good Friday. And uh, see what the Bible has to say as far as how to worship God. Because if you look today, the world is getting excited, is getting, is preparing itself to get into Easter. Aren't you, aren't you, uh, if you have anything to say on that, you can go ahead. I don't have much to say per, uh, like that, but we, like I said, we're definitely into the book, some historical documents and um, documentation. Let's go ahead and start debunking the truth, because uh, the Bible says the God is the Spirit. He got to be worshiping the Spirit and truth, so let's go ahead and let's get started. Well, let's actually start with reading that. Right. John chapter 4, I'll, I'll read it for you. <coughs> John chapter 4. Let me know where you want to pick it up at. Alright, so John chapter 4, yeah. and we start at verse 21, because oh. here, uh, Christ is talking to a Samaritan woman at the well, and first he asked her about uh, a drink of water, so long story short, Christ is telling her about the spiritual water, if she would have asked him, he would have gave it to her. Right. So we're going to pick it up at verse 21. <clears throat> you got a brother, go ahead. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh... We shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Go ahead. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So you want to know about the real doctrine of God? You want to know what you need to save yourself? You have to find you a Jew, or an Israelite in this case. Keep going. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Go ahead. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So the Father is looking for worshipers to do it in spirit and in truth. So we don't have the audacity to worship God according to what we want to do or how we feel. But instead, verse 24. <clears throat> God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So in spirit and in truth. And these are requirements. And if you read in your Bible, this is what Jesus is saying about his own mouth. Right. Anything you want to add, bro? Well, I mean, another another thing to consider is he says you got to worship him in spirit and in truth. So, if there's a right way to worship him, evidently there's a wrong way also by default. Mm -hmm. If there's a wrong way, if you're being deceived, then your worship is in vain, according to Matthew chapter 15. And another thing to consider is uh, how he says worship him in spirit. Well, the law is spiritual. And it's the law that shows you how to worship God. That's that's what that's what the Jews were given. The oracles of God, the laws of God, his statutes, his charges, his commandments, things to that effect. So you hit that you hit that on the nail. So um <clears throat> so we're gonna uh we're gonna get into really Eastern Passover and Big Friday all at once. You know, because and I, I'm a, and I'm a, and I'm gonna attack this right off the bat because they say Good Friday is when Jesus died, and then Easter Sunday is when he resurrected. So we're gonna we're gonna turn over to Matthew chapter 12 just to start things off. I said start things off like three four times. But it's cool, okay. Man. It's we're okay. gonna start. It. We're gonna start. It. Yeah, we're just gonna read. <clears throat> One verse here. Two verses. Three, actually. And Matthew chapter 12, we'll pick it up at verse 38. You get to go ahead and read. Mm -hmm. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we will see a sign from thee. Go ahead. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it. 
but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, it's, you know, time after time, well, particularly in this moment, it says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And it's crazy because if you look throughout the Old Testament, Jesus gave you plenty of signs and miracles that would be taking place mm -hmm. just to be showing you that, listen, this is this is me who is talking about. That's right. From him being born of a virgin woman, from him being born in Bethlehem, Judea. All this is prophecy. He's given plenty of signs, but no one wants to believe him. But keep reading, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So when Jesus is now giving him uh, a sign, he's letting them know, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm telling you, one time I was, uh, I was working at Taco Mac, and I was talking to this lady. And uh, Christmas just went by. January and New Year's just went by. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't celebrate Christmas, you know. She's like, oh, you don't celebrate Easter either, don't you? I was like, no. She's like, why not? I was just like, cause you know, think about it. From Good Friday to Easter Sunday, he told you he'd be in the grave for three days and three nights. So you got he 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 died at evening now. So you got one night, which is Friday going into uh, is going to Friday. Then you got Friday morning. That's that's one day. Mm -hmm. Then you have Friday night. And then you have Saturday day. I think I'm doing this math wrong, actually. No, 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 no. Died at Friday night is what they're saying. And then, but basically from, if you go from Friday to Saturday and Sunday, you don't get three days and three nights. Like day and a half. You get like a day and a half. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can calculate three days and three nights. It's like when you go to theology school, they tell you to give up basic math skills in order to teach these people. Because they want to feed you a doctrine. But it's not according to the Bible. And when I told her, I showed her this scripture. Where Jesus himself said. Because this is red ink right here. It says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And when she read that, she said, well, I don't think he really meant that. Really? You don't think he, then why would he say it? And that's, that's, that's the issue. God is calling for us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a God of knowledge. So we got to do these things with understanding. Therefore, if He's going to tell you He's going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, guess what? If someone wants to give you a doctrine, which is Easter and in in Good Friday, if it doesn't parallel with the Bible, it's false doctrine. The Lord is not going to accept this form of worship. But where are you going to go? Because I saw you... Oh, okay. Let's read some history. Okay. So this is off of history.com in regards to Easter. And it says, it's a Christian holiday that celebrates the belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In the New Testament of the Bible, the event is said to have occurred three days after Jesus was crucified by the Romans and died in roughly 30 AD. The holiday concludes at the Passion of Christ, a series of events and holidays that began with Lent, which Lent is false as well. Right. A 40 day period of fasting and prayer and sacrifice mm. and ends with a holy week which includes the holy thursday the celebration of jesus last supper with his 12 apostles which is really passover good friday on which jesus death is observed and easter sunday although a holiday of high religious significance the christian faith many traditions associated with easter date back to pre-christian pagan times so we have a holiday here that goes back to pre-Christian, before Christ even set foot on the earth, they were dealing with Easter under a, a different name. Right. <clears throat> Anything else on that? Let me see what else I got. We'll come back to that. Okay, we'll come back. Another thing to be mindful of is that they'll tell you that he died right before the Sabbath. Which concludes that the Sabbath is Saturday. The world would openly admit the Sabbath is Saturday just to, you know, solidify how, you know, factual Good Friday is. But, when we read here in John chapter 19, which is where we're going to go next. John chapter 19. 
And this is, uh, Jesus done gave up the ghost and everything. We're, we're going to, uh, John chapter 19 and verse 30. We can, we can pick it up from there. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He died. He gave up the ghost. That's what that means. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Right. For that Sabbath day was a high, was a high day. What, what kind of Sabbath was it? A high day. So, once you get into the scriptures, you realize there's, there's more than one type of Sabbath. You have your regular weekly Sabbath. Then you also have your high Sabbaths. Mm -hmm. You read in Exodus chapter 23, where the Lord has commanded us to, to appear before him three times out of the year. That's Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. We can read that. That's what it means to worship him in spirit and in truth. But Jesus himself, he had to be taken off of the cross before that high Sabbath. We're not talking about the weekly Sabbath here though, brothers and sisters. Let's turn over to Daniel chapter 9. Man, I'll, I'll read it for you then. How about that? Alright. Yeah, I'll read it for you. <coughs> Gotta find it. Daniel chapter 9, where you want me to pick it up? You can do verse 25. Get right to the point. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem... Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. So Daniel here is getting a vision from Gabriel, and in this piece he's talking about the restoration of Israel. Keep going. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So Messiah is going to be killed, but the scripture is going to tell us like when that's going to happen. Keep going. And the people of the prince shall, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the desolations are end of the war desolations are determined. Keep going. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. No, no, Good Friday. <laughs> and in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So it says here the Messiah is going to be cut off. He's going to be killed in the midst of the week, which we all know to be Wednesday. We say it now. Matter of fact, we say in the midst of something. You don't say it at the end. We're in the middle. Christ died on a Wednesday, which already debunks the whole Good Friday, the Easter Sunday doctrine. Mm. Matter of fact, we can show you that God rose towards the end of the Sabbath, which we're, we're probably going to do that. Okay. Let's go to Matthew 28. 28, 20, 20, 20, yeah. 26. 26, probably. No, that's 28. So we're here at Matthew 28. Christ has already been crucified. So Matthew 28 and verse 1. When you got it, you can go ahead. In the end of the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. So it says at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. So we're talking about Saturday night now. It's not even going into Sunday yet. Keep going. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to, the, to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the, from the door and sat upon it. Mm -hmm. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. So Mary Magdalene and other Mary, they went down to see the sepulchre. They wanted to check on Christ. But when they get there, basically, angels already rolled the door back. Keep going. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So keep in mind now, the first uh, verse says, at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. So in other words, late Saturday, as it was still the Sabbath, and it's going into the first day of the week, it's telling us here that Christ has already risen. He's walking around. He's doing, he's doing his thing now. Mm. 
And after you put the days together, so you have from Wednesday to Friday, I'm sorry, from Wednesday to the Sabbath, that's your three days and three nights. That math adds up perfectly. Right. You got, um, man, think about it. You got Wednesday night. <laughs> you got some paper? <laughs> yeah, let's write it down yeah. for you guys. So you can see it. Oh, I got some right here. And then for those who aren't sure what determines a day, I'm going to read something in Genesis real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me get that for you. So Genesis 1, every time God would create someone, he would tell you from this from this to this means a day. So let's pick it up at verse 7 for me. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Mm -hmm. And God called the heaven, or called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. You say from the evening and the morning were the second day. Not 12 o'clock, a.m. Peace. Evening and morning. So a day starts at evening. So that's important. So now you determine your days. Right. So go ahead, brother. Go ahead and write that out. Uh, and we're going to give you right he's writing that up so um even when you once you get a little bit more understanding about it go ahead. so this is chicken scratch here. <laughs> yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And we're going to see, as in Matthew 12, where Jesus said he was going to be in the grave for three days and three nights. Now, the evening is the beginning of the day. So, Wednesday evening, which was rolling into Thursday, that's your first night. Then, Thursday morning, that's your first morning. Then, rolling into Friday... Which is beginning Friday, you got that evening, that Thursday evening. That's your second night. Then you have Friday morning. Then you have Friday evening rolling into Saturday, which is the beginning of Saturday. Then you have Saturday morning. Jesus told you he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. I'll go back and read it real fast. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. It says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So according to the Bible, from Good Friday to Sunday, it is physically impossible to be there for three days and three nights. That's right. Jesus is a flesh and blood man. His understanding of time, our 24 hours is 24 hours to him too, brothers and sisters. It's not different. So, this is how you get three days and three nights, according to Daniel chapter 9, where it says he would be, you know, he, in the midst of the week, he would cause the, sacrifi the sacrifices and the oblation to cease. Why? Because once he was crucified, once he died, the, the, re the, the, what's it called? The, what I'm talking about? The veil. The veil between the most holy place and the holy place, it rent. That means there was no more sacrifices going to be done anymore. This debunks Easter doctrine, which really ties you back to the worship of the sun. It's on the first Sunday. When Passover, which we're going to read about, this is what Jesus wanted us to remember, brothers and sisters. He didn't want us, he, had, he told you to remember his death. That's what we're going to get at right now, Matthew chapter 26. And uh, when you get there, pick it up at verse. Actually, no. First, let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we'll pick it up at verse. Whew. Let's see. Yeah, let's pick it up at verse. 20, uh, verse 26. Oh, 25. We'll just jump down. Right. Go ahead. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? 
John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. Go ahead. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, whose shoes latch it, I'm not worthy to unloose. Now I just wanna think about something. <clears throat> Everybody wanna be so cool with Jesus like they like like he's a, he's your homie. Mm -hmm. Like like you know him like that. When John was so humble, he said, Man, I'm not even worthy of untying this dude's shoelaces. Mm -hmm. So who are you? Just be mindful of that. Have some humility. That's right. And humility really comes with understanding because John understand the operation of God. He was born with the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters. So, but jump down to verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. What is he? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Why is he considered the Lamb of God? Because the Lamb was representative of the fact that when someone has sin, talking about in the Old Testament, when someone had sin, according to the Old Covenant, when someone sinned, they had to sacrifice a lamb. Something had to die in, the, in, in that person's place. Something had to die. And because that lamb did, because the Lord had mercy on us, had grace on us, I'm not going to let you die instead. You got to offer up an, a lamb. So, now John is talking to Jesus. He says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Because this, now, it's, <laughs> I want to go to Colossians chapter 2. I'm sorry. Before. Yeah, Colossians chapter 2. Brother Spirit leads you, brother. Right. Because it, it all ties in together. It's all ties in together. It's important that we acknowledge the Passover and all together the feast days of the Lord. And Paul is going to let you know why. Let's, uh, let's, let's read verse 8 first, though. All right. Go ahead. Let's see. Colossians 2. <laughs> <laughs> verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through, vain, through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Where do you read Good Friday in the Bible? The closest you can get is preparation because it's talking about the day before the high Sabbath. But when you read Daniel chapter 9, it tells you he was cut off in the midst of the week, which is Wednesday. So it debunks Good Friday. It's, these traditions are not found in, the, found in the Bible. That's why when he says to worship you, worship God in spirit and in truth, guess what? It's this word of God that's going to teach you how to worship Christ. Easter is not a method of doing it. But he says, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. Because just like he was reading, you know, on Easter, Easter existed before Jesus came into the flesh. They were already keeping Easter. Once again, it's worshiping the Son. That's what Easter points to. And it says, and not after Christ. Because if you're keeping these traditions, you're being pulled away from Christ. Mm -hmm. You can't do both. He tells you you can't drink of the cups, the Lord, the cups, the Lord's cup and the cup of devils. You can't do. Like it says, what business does Christ have with Belial? They can't. They can't work together. You got to pick a side, brothers and sisters. And if you pick Easter, if you pick Good Friday, listen, then you're not on God's team. But jump down to verse 16. I'm going to ask something for you to read, too. And he made a good point on a Facebook post. When you see the, um, the stupid commercial with Reese's. Right. They're playing, you know, let's get it on. Right. Like, they got nothing to do with Christ. When you do, matter of fact, if you do just a little bit of research, you'll find out that Easter is dealing with like fertility goddess. That's why you have bunnies and eggs and yeah. leaves. Like they all represent like like sexual artifacts per se. Right. But like I said, people like you do just a, a slight bit of research, you'll find that out. That's crazy. We had the in information age, yeah, information yeah. at the at the, at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. We're the dumbest ones, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. No disrespect, but we just do your research. Don't be ignorant to it, because it's that ignorance that's going to end us up in the lake of fire. But verse 16, please. Let no man therefore judge you in me.
I'll give it. I think it's back. Okay, it said poor connection for a second, but it says let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, not holiday, but in holy day. Go ahead. Or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath day. Of the Sabbath days, plural. Don't let anybody judge you for keeping Passover. Well, it's not a Sabbath, but uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Don't let anybody judge you in these things. Why? Verse 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. These are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. All these feast days point to something. It's pointing to Christ and his, sal and his plan of salvation to get man out of this curse called death. So from there, we can turn over to Matthew chapter 26. Because you got to understand, Passover has been here since the Old Testament. From when, when God was dealing with Moses to get Israel out of Egypt. And he told Moses, he said, hey, tell these people, go get you a lamb on the 14th day of the first month. And we're going to address New Year's also. He said on the first 14th day of the first month, go get you, oh, on the 10th month, 10th day actually, on the 10th day of the first month. Go get you a lamb. Have it until the 14th month. On the 14th month, kill it. You know, roast it. Eat the eat the flesh, but take the blood and sprinkle it over your door doorpost. So when he sends down that 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 angel that that's really gonna be sending destruction, cause he's gonna kill the firstborns in Egypt. So he says, when I send him in there, listen, I'm gonna see that blood over the doorpost, and I'm gonna pass over you. It literally means what it's saying. He's gonna pass. He's gonna overlook you. When you should have died in your sins, guess what? You're going to be spared. And this was happening on a small scale with the blood of the bulls and the goats. But guess what? Jesus came and now he's fulfilled that role by being that Lamb of God that John spoke of in John chapter 1. John the Baptist said in the book of John. Matthew chapter 26 and uh, pick it up at verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples... Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. Easter. The Passover. Easter. The Passover. The feast of the Passover. Mm -hmm. You see Jesus himself keeping Passover. That's right. If our master is keeping Passover, why are we saying we're his disciples? And really, if you're a disciple of something, then you follow the discipline of that thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's what disciple roots from. How, we, how do we say we are disciples, but not follow the disciplines or the teachings or the doctrines of Christ? Mm -hmm. He was keeping the Passover. Go ahead. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he is to be killed on the Passover. You got to understand. Jump down to, uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Jump down to verse uh, 26. And uh, this is when they're actually doing the Passover. And then we should address communion too. Because communion is false also. It has nothing to do with Christ. Go ahead though, please. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Just like when you saw the, just like, I, we didn't read it, but you can go and read it in Exodus. Where they, like I said, they killed the lamb, they ate the flesh of the lamb. And then... They sprinkled the blood over the doorpost. So when he, he said, take this, take, eat, this is my body, verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to, and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. Why? For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Just like that lamb was slain in the Old Testament, guess what? We got a greater sacrifice here. See, they had to do that year after year, year after year, but, the, but the, it wasn't good enough. A man brought sin into the world, brothers and sisters. So what a lamb got to do with it? A man brought sin into the world, so guess what? A man's going to have to take it out. And that's what that's the role Jesus fulfilled. That's what his death signifies. That's why he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We didn't, hear, we didn't read one time Easter. You got to understand, this was Passover taking place. Go, uh, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. 
You know that one scripture where he says, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it's in Luke. I think it's Luke's account. Okay. What is that? Where it's talking about, it's the same account about this, but he tells you to remember my death. I'm thinking about that scripture right now. I saw earlier. I think it's in Luke. But let's keep going. Well, if it comes to me, we'll, we'll address it. If it comes our way, we'll address it, you know. Is it... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Luke chapter 22. <coughs> okay. Yeah. I've seen those uh, Passover shirts. And that just came to my mind, yeah. How about wait for it? <laughs> All right, what you got, Luke what? Luke chapter 22, and we're going to read, and we're going to verse 19. You know, we just read it in Matthew, but guess what? We're going to read it again in Luke and see the account of Luke, what is being said. Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He said, Do this in remembrance of me. We no longer have to take a lamb, kill it, sprinkle the blood over the doorpost. Why? Because this is the greater version of doing it out. He's that sacrifice. He's fulfilled it. And so, now, what we do is take the blood, the wine, and we drink that in representation of his blood. And then we eat the unleavened bread in representation of his body. But he says, this do in remembrance of me. We're talking about Passovers, brothers and sisters, not Easter. I just want to go there real quick. But now we can go to Leviticus. What's up, yes? Well, yeah, so this, um, going off Cephas' point, when you take the wine, you take the bread, it clearly says here, this is my body, which is given for, for you, this do in remembrance of me. So you're remembering, like, that particular day where Christ died. Right. Which was not every first and third Sunday. <laughs> That's why, like, that, I'm telling you, man, communion, like, people look forward to that, but they don't know what they're doing. That's right. why the Lord says, um, what is it, lack of knowledge? Like, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. Yeah, it's That's, Hosea 4. Mm -hmm. You want to read it real quick? I got something. You got something? Yeah, but Romans 3. Okay. It's either Romans 3 or Romans 2. I can't think of it. What's it say? I think it's. Yeah, Romans 10. Okay. Where do you want to pick it up from? Verse 1, because okay. uh, Paul's going to yeah. say something. Like, this is um, particularly for the whole world, but Israel in general at this point. So, it, uh, Romans 10, verse 1. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. But not according to knowledge. So Israel or the so-called African American, they have a zeal for God, which you see, but it's not according to knowledge. Because they're filling up the churches on every Sunday. Right. <clears throat> That's not even to bash, but it's the truth. And then they're partaking in the communion, first and third Sunday. They're doing Easter. They're doing Christmas. Thinking they're doing something for God, that zeal, but not according to knowledge. First three. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So being ignorant to what God already laid out for us, they go about to establish their own righteousness. So now you create your own standard of sin, your own method of serving God, your own denominations. And God's not having none of that. Mm. Let's see. That's it on there. That's all I want to read. Mm. There's the Lord. That's true, though. Is it Leviticus 23? Yeah, Leviticus 23. We're gonna we're gonna look at we're gonna look at the feast days. Because mm -hmm. you can see Jesus keeping the feast days. Mm -hmm. You can see Paul, the apostles keeping the feast days. Paul specifically, because you see a lot about his journeys and preaching the gospel. Even after Jesus' death, you still see him keeping the pe the feast days. And the Sabbath, brothers and sisters, which is not Sunday. Mm -hmm. 
Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll pick it up at verse 1. Alright. When you get there, go ahead and read, please. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which, shall, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So, Jesus... God, really, if you if you if you get some understanding, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament also. But He's saying, "Speak unto the children of the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of Moses, of the Lord, of your pastor, the Lord." So these are the feasts that God has put aside that He considers holy. This is how He wants you to be worshipped. This is how He wants to be worshipped according to Spirit and truth, right? So it says, concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. And holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. In Jerusalem. In all your dwellings. So, no matter where you are, the very first feast day of the Lord. And I, and I point this out because I used to be seventh day of Venice. And they, they claim to keep the Sabbath when they really defile it. No, I'm just being honest. And when I start getting to the truth, I asked them. Because I learned about the feast days, which they do not teach. They'll say, talk about the dietary law. They'll talk about the Sabbath day, but they won't talk about the feast days. And I asked them, why don't we keep the feast days? And they said, well, the feast days were done away with. Well, if that's the case... Then the the regular weekly Sabbath is done away with. Because that's your very first feast in the Bible. The weekly Sabbath, the one that happens on you know, reg a weekly basis, that's your very first feast. It's spiritually taking place because man can't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And that's what we go to church to do, to get the word. So it says, six days shall work be done, but the Sabbath day is a Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. This is a spiritual feast. But verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which, you sh which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Now, the first w feast happens on a weekly basis. But these feasts that we're about to get into, there's a distinction. Not only... Is the first feast something done spiritually? Well, these feasts we're going to get into are done physically now. Spiritually and physically. Because you get the word and then we also feast. Physically. But at the same time, it says, Which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So this is going to happen one time out of the year, brothers and sisters. Not every first and third Sunday like he was talking about. Or like the Seventh Day Adventists do it. They do it every three months. This is not how it goes. Let's get some understanding, brothers and sisters. Let's read about these feasts. Verse 5. And the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Easter. That the Lord's Passover. Good Friday. And the Lord's Passover. Oh, man. Passover is all over here. Mm -hmm. Not yet have we read about Easter. It says that on the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And what happens right after that? And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must you must eat unleavened bread. So we're not really gonna get into feast of unleavened bread, cause really y'all should go do some studying yourselves and get into Leviticus twenty three. That'll give you all your feast days. But really, we came here for Passover to show you this is a feast of the Lord. This is what Jesus is telling us to keep, you know, because we saw it in the Old Testament. It's, you know, been still holding weight in the New Testament. Jesus observed it. The apostles observed it. Paul told you in Colossians, keep the feast. You know, which are shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. They point you to Christ, brothers and sisters. Easter is not a feast day, so it's not pointing you to Christ. It's not teaching you anything about God. It doesn't even give you the correct day that he resurrected on. You got anything to add on that? I'm trying to find something. I was going to read where Paul kept the feast. Go ahead and watch it out. You know, do Acts 20. Is it Acts 20? Yeah. That's one of them. Because it's all over. It's all over Acts. Yeah, you're right. Acts 20. No, you good on that. Well, I'm already here. Why not? Right. So Acts 20 and verse 16. 
Because like uh, Brother Cephas already said, you no, know, Christ, he's already dead, died and risen and sitting back to heaven at this point. Right. So if the feast was done away with, the law was done away with, we would have a clear distinction of that happening. Matter of fact, when Christ gave the uh, Great Commission to go out and preach the gospel to all nations, he could have slipped in, oh yeah, don't worry about that law either, you straight. <laughs> but he didn't do that. Right, right, right. So Acts 20 and verse 16, when you got it, go ahead. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost is one of the feasts that the Lord has set, set for us. And saying that Paul hasted. He was trying to hurry and get back to Jerusalem right. so he can keep the feast. But if they're done away with, Paul's putting in this effort for no reason. So it's letting you know the feasts haven't gone anywhere. Right. And again, like Brother Cephas said, these point to something. How God's going to save this man. You can't get that in Christmas. You can't get that in Easter. Matter of fact, we could have just read all of Leviticus 23, ended it on some, this is what God told us to do, shut the book. <laughs> like, what else do you need? Right. Go ahead and read verse 6 on that too. All right. I'll read it. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, which we where we abode seven days. So again, unleavened bread, which is the, like the next day after Passover. It's uh, further proven that the feasts are still valid. As a matter of fact, Paul's keeping them. I think what Christ has been, at least 14 years have passed by, and Christ ascended back into heaven. Right. So it's good. it was good back then, it's good to this day. Right. Can I sit on that? I don't have anything else. I don't got nothing on that. Well, let's look at oh, this yeah. new... Oh, what's up? I do. So, um... So we already given you the truth on what Passover is and what Easter is not. So, real, real quick. So, what you like? What are you worshiping when you're really dealing with Easter? He said the sun, which is absolutely true, but they put it in the form of a goddess with many names, and it doesn't derive far. Easter, Ishtar, Astarte. As you read something about that, let's go to Jeremiah seven. Okay. It's crazy because when you read Matthew 24, God tells you, and this gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world. So you can't stand in front of God. Oh, I ain't know. <laughs> right. I like, know you knew. And on top of that, you have like, Google at your fingertips. Mm hmm. Ooh, okay. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 7. There's a name I want to read, and then we're going to look into that name. So Jeremiah 7 and verse 15. You got you gotta read that. I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor pray for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. So whatever they're doing, God is saying, I'm gonna cast them out, don't make prayer, don't make intercession for these people at all. So God is pissed at this point. Right. What for? Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. So the children are gathering firewood. The, uh, the fathers are kindling the fire, the women are kneading their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. So about have a, a whole worship celebration. But it says the queen of heaven. It don't say God here at all. So who's this queen of heaven? We keep reading. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. So they're making, uh, pretty much they're cooking up this food to the queen of heaven. You know, pissing God off, provoking him to anger. And Malachi 3 lets you know God does not change. So if it angered him back then, it angers him to, it angers him to this day. Right. You get some more on this queen of heaven. Again, not to bash, but when you, you know, you go out and buy your outfits for all your children and yourself. You go on to church on you no know, Resurrection Sunday, they call it now. This is what you're doing. So the Queen of Heaven was a title given to a number of ancient sky goddesses worshipped throughout the ancient Mediterranean Mediterranean. Can you bring it closer by that place? Yeah. Okay. In the ancient Mediterranean Mediterranean and Near East during ancient times, goddesses known to have been referred to by title include what is it? Inanna, Anat, Isis, Astarte, Hera, and possibly Ashura by the prophet Jeremiah. This is Wikipedia telling us now. Right, right. In Greco-Roman times, Hera and the Roman aspect Juno bore this title. 
forms and content of worship vary. In modern times, the title Queen of Heaven is still used by contemporary pagans to refer to the great goddess. Wow. While Catholics, Catholics, Orthodox, Catholics, <laughs> Catholics, Orthodox, and some Angelican Christians now apply the ancient title to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm. So this is Wikipedia telling you, uh, referring you back to Jeremiah, which you just read. So this Queen of Heaven, uh, depending on your geographical location, this is who you're dealing with right. on Easter Sunday, along with uh, when you're dealing with Lent. That's Tammuz, another sun god. Oh, man, we can read it here, too, in Ezekiel chapter 8. All right. I actually just flipped over there. Oh, I got you. Yeah. And all this Easter, Lent, all, all mm -hmm. roads lead to Rome, brothers and sisters. Straight up. You want to call yourself a Methodist? You want to call yourself a Baptist? A seven-day Adventist? Guess what? All these doctrines that we we think worship God, mm -hmm. they lead all the way back to Rome. Mm -hmm. And you read in Revelation chapter 17. Is that? Yeah, that's Revelation chapter 17. Want to read it? Yeah, I'll read it real fast. All right. I got you. Yeah. You can pick verse 1, actually. All right. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. This great whore sitteth upon many waters. And when it says waters, brothers and sisters, it's talking about people. A lot of people are tuned in into this great whore. And this is the, what the Bible says. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't write, I didn't write whore, brothers and sisters. <laughs> the Bible said whore. Mm -hmm. I'm just reading what it says. It says... I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Go ahead. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, this great whore has fornicated, and we're not talking physically, we're talking about spiritually, mm -hmm. have seeped her, her fingers into many kings. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We're all, not necessarily all of us, but the, those in the world are drunk off the fornication of this great whore. And we're not talking about something physical. Once again, it's spiritual. We're, they're drunk off the doctrine of this great whore. Go ahead. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Go ahead. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now, I don't got to say that, but just look how Rome dressed, these classic dress, these priests. Mm -hmm. Looking exactly like that. Even in their physical appear, but at the same time it says having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, did she? Now Rome don't got a literal cup in their hand, but spiritually speaking, once again, well, they're all drunk off this doctrine. Now think about it, the Catholic Church was the biggest church, and from them you saw Protestants branch off of. You saw, you know, Methodist, Baptists. They all didn't want to, you know. Answer to the Pope, but they still kept their doctrine. Where do you think Christmas come from? It originated with Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Easter, communion, holy communion. These people don't want to say they're Catholics, but you keep their doctrines. That's why in verse 5, what's it read? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. She is the mother of harlots. She's the great whore, and guess what? Her daughters are harlots too. Because mm -hmm. they're all on the same junk. The same false doctrine. You want to call yourself a Methodist? Guess what? You do the same thing the Baptists do. Mm -hmm. You keep the same traditions. And they all came from Rome. So from there we're going to turn over to Ezekiel chapter 8. Because really what happens is, you know, Catholic, Catholics, they, they want to they have, wanna have a, a great number of people following them. So what do they do? Okay, we're just going to put a Jesus stamp on other pagan traditions. It's okay. You can worship God how you want to. Just say you're Catholic. It's cool. You know? But that's not how it works. Because like we read in John chapter 4, Jesus is to be worshipped in 
spirit and in truth. So Ezekiel chapter 8, we'll pick it up at, uh, we'll just go to verse 12, just get to the point. All right. Go ahead. Then said he unto me, son of man, has thou seen what the angels of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the Lord seeth, seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. So, Ezekiel is being shown by God, you know, all the abominations and wickedness taking place in Israel at this time. And it's still happening today, you know, on a larger scale. It's happening worldwide. Because you have a large percentage of the world calling on the name of Jesus. Believing in they, that they worship Jesus, but really, they're doing so much abominations in the eyes of God. Verse 14, oh, verse 13. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. So if you keep, so if you're reading this chapter, he'll, he'll show them one thing and be like, man, check this out. There's an even greater abomination here. Mm -hmm. And now he's about to show them an even greater abomination than those, than what, uh, those ancients were doing. Verse 14. Then he brought me to the door of the, of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold... There sat a woman weeping for Tammuz. For Tammuz. And we just, we're just reading. He brought up Tammuz. What, what, what does it say about Tammuz again? You can, if you can find it. But it's another form of false worship. Ties in with Easter. and Starte. Because I believe that was her son. And she slept with her son. Some more fertility, fornication, gross, weird, <laughs> sick goddess stuff going on that we don't even know about. But we, but we, we're, we're, we're in the church pews every every first Sunday of April, you know, or of spring. I don't, I don't know how it goes by, but it's not pertaining to God. That's the point. It's false <laughs> worship, and we we go for a head first. If you gotta go ahead and read, it says Tammuz, a god of fertility, embodying the powers for new life in nature in the spring. The name Tammuz seems to have been derived from the. The Akkadian form of Tamuzi, based on the early Sumerian Demazid. The flawless young, which in later standard Sumerian became wow. Dumuzu and Dumuzi. The earliest known mention of Tammuz in the text dating to the early part of the early dynastic third period, but his cult probably was much older, although the cult is attested for much. For but, most Oh, real quick. Just one thing I want to point out that you did bring up. It says, embodying the powers of new life in nature in the spring. So, one thing that people like to tie to, they don't realize, is that they, you know, attach Tammuz to Jesus. Because, like, because Tammuz is the son of Astarte. And Jesus, he's the son of God. So they want to, you know, up, attach those two. Like I said, you look at in these Catholic church where you see the Romans having their idols. They got idols of Tammuz and saying, oh, that's Jesus. But that's false worship. So from here, we're going to go into the new year because we got really off track. just. Now. <laughs> but it's okay. Right. You know, we're getting some edification out there. We're learning. Lord willing, somebody's learning right now. So for, we're going to turn over to Exodus chapter 12. You want to tackle that one? I get it. Okay. Exodus, I'll get, I'm not even there yet. I'm talking. All right. Well, where do you want me to pick it up at? Alright, we'll start at verse 1. Let's skip. Me too. Right. Extra 12 and verse 1. So, Israel has been just led out of Egypt at this point. So, the Lord is going to start dealing with them. He's going to give them their, I won't say their first commandment, but their first, their Passover. So, verse 12, I mean, verse 1, chapter 12. Let's go. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So it's important to identify this first month. And it's not January, because again, we'll read the history of how January came to be. But uh, the first month is important, because that, that starts the Passover, going on to Unleavened Bread. 
So you don't want you don't want to have that first month wrong, and all your whole feast calendar is thrown off. Right. Keep going. Speaking unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So this is pertaining to the Passover, which uh, Brother Cephas was talking about earlier. So we'll leave that alone since you already tackled Passover. Let's go to verse, uh, Exodus chapter 23. Let's go to uh, 13 real quick. Right? Right. Chapter 13. Because you saw in Exodus 12, in Exodus 12, it told you that uh, he was giving them the beginning of months. And really, that was when they were about to get out of Egypt. He said, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Well, if you go into Exodus chapter 13, it gives you a name of that first month. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 4. Uh, pick it up at verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. And then they're, and they're approaching the feast of unleavened bread. Keep that in mind. But verse 4 is what we came here for. This day came you out in the month of Abib. January. Abib. So we saw in Exodus 12 where it says this is the beginning of months. And now in Exodus chapter 13, he's giving you a name for that month. And it says, This day came ye out of the month Abib. The same one we read in Leviticus chapter 23. When we're talking about Passover. It says in the first month, you know, on the 14th day, at even is the Lord's Passover. We're talking about that same time frame. It's in the first month. But are we talking about January? No, brothers and sisters. We're talking about the beginning of spring. The, when things start coming back to life. How do we have New Year's when everything is still dead? New Year's is when everything st should start bringing back, coming back to life. And if you start getting to Leviticus and you see how God was revolving all his feast days around agriculture, it would be impossible for the New Year to begin in the dead of winter when everything is dead. So, he's about to pull something up. And I'm going to let him do that. He's going to bring out the origin of January. And I actually uh, did this a couple, uh, probably like two months ago. Talking about January. And he's going to bring it up right now. Alright. This should be. New Year's Day, also called simply New Year's, is observed January, on January 1st, the first day of the year of the modern Gregorian calendar as well as the Julian calendar. In pre-Christian Rome, under the Julian calendar, if the day was dedicated to Janus, God of gateways and beginnings, for whom January is also named. And if you look into this God Janus, it's a two-headed God, one facing the past, one facing the future, which the New Year's revolution Revolution. Resolution comes from. As a date in the Gregorian calendar of Christendom, New Year's Day, liturgically marked the feast of the naming and the circumcision of Jesus, which is still observed as such in Anglican Church and Lutheran Church. So they're going to say, wow, I never read that before. But they're going to say, no, let me get that output right here. It says, well, right off the bat, when it brought up the God of Janus, that's a Roman God. And the first commandment God gave to Israel, in Exodus chapter 20, if you can read that real cool, verses 1 and 2, yeah, oh, 3, 3, 1 through 3. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You can have, but you, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that God of Janus need to go out the window. Why are we acknowledging another God in the presence of our God, the true and living God, and all other gods are, felt, are false? Don't work that way, brothers and sisters. And then right here it also says, Where did you read that? Oh, right here it says, As a date in the Gregorian calendar of Christendom, New Year's Day liturgically marked the feast of naming and circumcision of Jesus. 
They're probably trying to say that Jesus was born on December 25th mm -hmm. and he was circumcised on New Year's. When biblical, huh? Yeah. yeah. And biblically mm -hmm. speaking, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. You can't read that. Mm -hmm. See, all these false religions or all these false holidays have some similarity to them and they work together. But it's on, they're working together to get you in the lake of fire. Because they're pulling you away from the truth. The, the the December New Year's pulls you away from Abib, which I'm gonna, we can pull up right here. You have it. I got you. Yeah. Abib, an ear of corn, the month of newly ripened grain, the first of the Jewish ecclesiastical year, and the seventh of the civil year. It began about the time of the vernal equinox on the 21st of March. It was called Nisan after the captivity in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 on the 15th day of the month. Harvest was begun by gathering a sheaf of barley which was offered unto the Lord on the 16th day. But it says it began about the time of the vernal equinox. We're talking about springtime brothers and sisters. This is when the new year really is to be begin. And something I like to bring up is on April 1st. What's, what, what's April 1st? Fools. April Fools, cause you thinking the New Year's is in <laughs> December. Mm -hmm. You fooled, brothers and sisters. That's when the real New Year's is around. I'm not saying April twenty, April first on the dot, but it's relatively closer to that time than it is in December. Cause when you get to April, you get some good rain coming down. The grass is becoming green again. Mm -hmm. There's life back in nature. And everything is surrounded, like, his feast days are revolving around agriculture. Mm -hmm. So, when you go and observe the God of Janus, hey, that's death. Spiritually, physically, all around, it's just death. Mm -hmm. And you're being deceived. Deep, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we were talking about Passover, Passover. Easter, yeah. New Year. We, we, we touched Holy Communion just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Communion is not in the Bible. At all. Yeah, no. Christ didn't die every first and third Sunday. He did it. Now, <clears throat> let's turn over to Matthew chapter 15. Oh, yeah. Actually, no, let's do Mark chapter 7 because it gets straight to the point in Mark chapter 7. All right. Can you read something in Proverbs? Uh, where you, where at? Proverbs 20. Proverbs 28. Verse 9? No, where it says, Proverbs, where it says, there's a way that seems right to a man. Oh, so, man. I don't know what you're talking about. I know just what you're talking about. Yeah, Proverbs 16. Verse 25. I'll read it for you. Proverbs 16, verse 25. It says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's a powerful statement because, no, even the, but the Bible tells us uh, Satan would deceive the entire world. I'm trying to get your face in the camera, bro. It says, uh, Satan would deceive the entire world, which is true. I've been deceived. This brother was deceived. Mm -hmm. When we got word of the truth, we made that correction. Like that way that we were in, it seemed right unto us. But having continued that way, it says the way thereof are the ways of death. Mm. We're not talking about like a physical death. That's appointed to every man. If right. you don't see the coming of the Lord, it's with that lake of fire. Mm. And if we got time and the spirit move us, we'll we'll, we'll touch on how you, know, you can't worship God your way, your right. standard. Let's go to Mark chapter seven. All right. Say Mark seven. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up at verse one. You know what? Let's do Matthew chapter 15. I like how Jesus said in 15, in Matthew 15. Jesus cold, man. Yeah. <laughs> he gets you the feels, bro. Oh, man. What was that one? He was like, uh, who did David say was my Lord? So how did my son John say, ah. All right. So he asked that man no more questions. All right. All right. Matthew chapter 15. We'll pick it up at verse 1. All right. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? 
for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now you got these scribes and Pharisees, they're trying to attack Jesus verbally simply because his disciples, when they went and ate food, they didn't wash their hands beforehand. Mm -hmm. This was a tradition of the elder that you had to wash your hands before you ate. A tradition of the elder. What is also a tradition of the elders? Or of Christianity today, a tradition of the world? Passover. Whoa, 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 my bad. Easter. <laughs> Good Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, I look weird because I don't do Lent and I got a black cross on my forehead. Which, which really is preparing you for the mark of the beast. You don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. But it says, why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. What is Jesus' response? But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. That's what God is saying to these Pharisees. We have plenty of tradition out here, brothers and sisters, but no one wants to keep the commandments of God. And if you are keeping the traditions, there's no way you're going to please God. There's no way. Because if you're keeping the traditions, you are going to be breaking the commandments. You can't do both. Lord ain't going to let you have great understanding and still go contrary to his word. No, you got to pick a side, brothers and sisters. Jump down to uh, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw up nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor for me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's what Jesus says. Like, he's quoting Isaiah, but it still applies to the world today. It says, ye hypocrites. And I'm not calling you a hypocrite. It's what the Bible is saying. Reflect on your actions. See what you're doing. Is it contrary to the word of God? Are you keeping Easter instead of Passover? It says, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. So it's a bunch of lip service. It's a bunch of, I love Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm blessed and highly favored. God bless you, child. <laughs> but their heart is far from me. So when it comes down to the core, your mind, your understanding, it's not on God. It's on Satan. Because you're following, what, verse 9? But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You're, watching the, you're following the commandments of men. It was a man who gave you Easter. Mm -hmm. and really, it was Satan, because Satan works through these people, brothers mm -hmm. and sisters. It was a Satan who gave you these Easter, who gave you Christmas, who gave you Good Friday. Like, Jesus told you himself out of his own mouth. I'm going to be in the grave for three days and three nights. And Satan said, no. He died on Good Friday and resurrected Sunday. Mm -hmm. And when you get some spiritual understanding, you realize that, you know, he's our first fruits. So it, will, it, it don't make no sense that he resurrected on a Sunday because he had to go before the Lord. But that's another lesson within itself. It's crazy, you know, people say, I'm covered by the blood. <laughs> but like, all right, then you should you know, willingly want to do Passover. Right, right. right. Cause the one from Passover represents his blood. Mm -hmm. But we don't we do we you know, like he said, you know, we go out establishing our own righteousness and by default we can't submit to God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's what it says, but in vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. That's what we see on a large scale today. Mm -hmm. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 8. You got anything to add on that real quick though? Yeah. It's kind of off subject, but on subject at the same time. So kind of like you got a lot of people who think that I have this personal relationship with God. Now I can worship him how I want to. Because like he said, we, we home with Jesus is my homeboy. <laughs> right. Them stupid shirts they used to wear. Mm. But that ain't the case. So I'm gonna read two places. Let's go to um, Exodus 23 first. Okay. Yeah, 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 you brought that up earlier. Exodus 23, real quick. Let's just see. Can you even have a personal relationship? Can you know do the things you want to do the way you want to do it, and think the Lord's gonna be cool with it? Okay, Exodus 23 and verse 8. When you got it, you're going to read that. And thou shalt take no gift 
For the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words. Matthew 24. Oh, I'm bad. I'm bad. I'm bad. I'm bad. Verse 22. Okay. Verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So um, Lord, uh, Moses came down with the commandments of the Lord and he read them in the midst of the people and they said, All the Lord has said we would do. Keep going. <clears throat> Then went Moses, then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet as it were a paved work of fat, sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and eat and did eat and drink. So you have four individuals. So it says Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy elders. So seventy four people, four of them got their name called out personally. And they saw they slept with God to the point where God could have took his hand and touched them, right? It gets no personal than you eating with God. Let's go to Leviticus chapter ten. Leviticus 10, remember now, four of those names, eight with, <laughs> eight with God. So uh, Leviticus chapter 10, let's see if, you know, just because we have a self-proclaimed personal relationship with God, we can do what we want to do. So Leviticus 10, verse 1, you got to go ahead. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took them of them his censer, and put fire therein. And put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So apparently, remember, Nadab and Abihu, who uh, were one of the 74 who went up to the Lord, they made a strange offering that God didn't tell them to do. Keep going. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And he said, the Lord killed them, because they went contrary and did what they wanted to do without the Lord uh, giving them permission to do so. I thought I had a personal relationship with him, right? <laughs> and, I, and I'm not trying to be funny, but I'm saying that to say that, you know, God set, has a standard for all of us to follow. Right. And there is, like, first of all, we're already filthy in the eyes of God, so we can't have a personal relationship with him. Not to the point where we can change his standard. Mm. Man, well, I don't, don't want to keep the Sabbath. I like Sunday better. Right. Like, okay, yeah, sure, go for it. Like, <laughs> nah. So I went there to show that we don't have it like that. Right. So you, you, it's best for us to stick to the standard. That's what me and this brother both. No, we got everybody got to stick to the standard. Exactly. Shoot. I don't even want to go to Romans seven. I don't want to go to Romans eight. Let me, sure. go, let me let me go to it real quick. All right. Let me just glance at it. Yeah, looking at it. We're, we're going to read Romans 7 and one verse of Romans 7, which is verse 14. All right. For well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. So the law is spiritual, right? Turn over to Romans chapter 8 and read verse 7 and 8. All right. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So... It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Go ahead. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're in the flesh, if you're carnally thinking, if you're thinking carnally, you cannot please God. You know, when Jesus was talking to, uh, to, to these people, he said, listen, I give you earthly things. You know what I'm saying? If you can't understand that, how are you going to get this, the heavenly things? You won't even, you can't even touch those things if you can't get the earthly things down. If you can't, if you can't submit yourself to doing the Passover, which represents Jesus dying for your sins, like, yes, Jesus needed to resurrect. Don't get me wrong. But Easter has nothing to do with Jesus. You can't say, I'm, like, people want to be like, we got to bring Jesus back. Where he was, cause that's where he belongs. That's a song. Mm. But Jesus wasn't in it to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember I would listen to that song all the time. But it, like they're wrong. That's that's their that's their lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. But in they're thinking carnally, cause they're taking carnal, you know, traditions 
and trying to apply it to a God that is spirit. But we read in Romans chapter 7, guess what? The law is spiritual, brothers and sisters. What do we read in the law? Passover, where it shows that Jesus died for your sins. Feast of Eleven Bread, where if you read it, it'll tell you, hey, this is representation of us no longer living in sin. Pentecost, you know, trumpets. Trumpets showing that, you know, this is pointing to the day of the Lord. Even the Sabbath is pointing to the thousand year reign with Christ when he established his kingdom on the earth. These are spiritual things. You got to put down these carnal things, brothers and sisters. Christmas, Easter, these things, like I said in Colossians 2, these feast days, listen, there are shadow of things to come and the body is of Christ. Christmas is not in that number. Easter is not in that number. Good Friday, like what? Really? Like, there's really nothing special about it. If you want to acknowledge Jesus' death, like it read in Luke chapter 22, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he was talking about Passover. Which happens to be 14 days after the real New Year's. Which is in, you know, April time. Around that time frame. March 21st, you know. But that's another lesson within itself to show you the real New Year's. You got anything to add to that? Nah, that's it. I don't have anything else. Mm -hmm. Cause we can really go on and on. oh oh you want to show them that one scripture? Okay. First Corinthians. I'll let you read it. Oh, I'll read it for you. First Corinthians. I think it's six. Read my mind, dude. Huh? Read my mind. Dude. Hey man, it's, it's reading from the same tree, bro. So I mean, look, if you if you haven't gotten anything else, nah, it's, it's not it's not. I know what you're talking about. I think it's First Corinthians ten. Okay. But I know what you're talking about because you brought it up. Yep. Wait, I read it for you, man. I mean, it's in two places. This is one of them. Are you talking about what fellowship have they? This one. Oh, it's kind of, yeah. It's along those lines. I'll, we'll read it, though. All right. I'll read it for you. Who you got? Verse 19. 10 and verse 20. <laughs> All right, that's not what I had in mind. Yeah, I know what you're talking All about, right, though, but... <clears throat> But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Mm -hmm. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the tables of devils. And you have to really consider this statement. Because he's saying here, you can't be on the Lord's team and the devil's team. Right. If you don't choose, you're on Satan's team by default. And if you're doing anything, if you celebrate anything contrary to what the Bible says, you're on Satan's team. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much you deny it, you, but I don't, I don't really claim it. You claim it, it's yours. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So it's best for you just to do what the Lord says. Because when the Lord gets back, he's going to destroy all that. There ain't going to be no Easter, no Christmas, right. New Year, St. Patrick's Day. And when you think about it from, a, from us, a cultural perspective, ain't got nothing to do with us. Right. Halloween and like I said, uh, one lesson I did, we go the we go the hardest for that stuff. Mm. We, we do. The, yeah, we go the hardest for that stuff, and we're supposed to be a priesthood nation, teaching others to stay away from that nonsense. Right. But I say that the Gentile that but I say that the thing that which the Gentiles sacrifice that sacrifice onto devils, and that's true. Is even an Easter tradition is you get an Easter ham, <laughs> and the Lord tells you clearly, you know. Don't don't eat swine. It's unclean to you. Right. And I would not have that you should fellowship with the devils. So you shouldn't be at the Easter Easter party, or the, your kids shouldn't be at the Easter egg hunts. Right. When you got time, you fellowship with devils. Mm. I'm looking for that one scripture that I know you talked about. I just how's it going? Was it, was it? Or it's just like um, it's the same one that says uh, what 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 business does you know. Christ with Belial. Is that the one you think about? No, I was going to, uh, the first Corinthians 6. But What's in first Corinthians 6? No, you not, don't be deceived. No, you're not. But we don't really need that one. No. We got to end it on something. Because we've been going for a minute. But yeah. The discussion has been about New Year's. Passover, 
Me and Eastern. Second Corinthians 6. Ah, uh, second Corinthians 6. I was in first. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to end it on Revelation, but we're going to okay. read this, though. Cool. You want 14, too? Yeah. Uh, no, just... Yeah, we can go there 14. Right? All right. Verse so, 14. All right. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? Mm. And what communion have light with darkness? Now, you know, you read the chapter 3. He says... Can two, like, two can't walk unless they agree. Mm -hmm. There has to be some form of agreement. So if you come with them speaking the word of God, and they, you know, don't believe, or they think contrary-wise, listen, it's going to be impossible for y'all to, I mean, to an extent. Y'all can live peaceably to an extent. But even in some cases, they don't even want to be around you. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, God is warning you, listen. You know, don't don't hang in the wrong crowd. You got this truth. Don't be around the wrong people because they can influence you, really. Because it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial, he's a fake god. He's a false god. He's created by the, the wicked imaginations of man. And Christ is the true and living God. So what what so you know what concord do they have? None. That's the answer, really. Go ahead. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And an infidel is someone who doesn't believe. You know. An atheist if you want to go to that extent. Verse sixteen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So, there's no, you know, there's no agreement between you and these other people. They want to keep their traditions. Guess what? You cannot follow them in their traditions. If you want to stay true to God, you need to stick with what you can read, brothers and sisters. And then it also says, in what agreement had the temple of God with idols? Nothing. For ye are the temple of the living God, not the false God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So guess what? Those people who don't want to keep the feast days, who don't want to acknowledge Jesus in his Passover, guess what? God isn't their people. They ain't God's people. You got to be mindful of that. If you want to be like them, you think they got the good life because you're under rules and regulations. <laughs> really? Rule, rules and regulations you want to be like them guess what you're not God's people because hey just like the Egyptians they didn't sprinkle the blood over their doorposts and their firstborn died guess what if you were an Israelite and you didn't have blood over your doorposts hey God's no respect to a person your firstborn would have died too mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is this is major to God you ain't going to make a shame of the sacrifice he did for you. He's going to get you. It says vengeance belongs to the Lord. But I got grace now. Right. <laughs> right. You got grace now? Hey, you shoot. Got grace now. Man, that make me want to go to Romans 6 just real fast. <laughs> Romans 6 just real quick. Spirit talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> you got grace you, now. You got grace now, huh? Do nothing grace now, but hey. <laughs> We're going to read two verses in Romans chapter 6, right. verse, verses 1 and 2. I'll read it for you. All right, go ahead. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So shall we continue in sin? 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is a transgression of the law. Right. So to say sin is no more, I mean to say the law is no more, means there's no sin. If we don't have sin, then why is Christ coming back in flame and fury? Whew. That would make God unfair. Right. So someone's lying here. But shall we say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So do we have this free pass to sin and do what we want to do and continue to break God's law because we have grace, which is basically the, the favor, the unmerited favor of God that we did not earn and right. could not earn? Right. Verse 3. I'm verse, sorry, verse 2. God forbid. So no, that is definitely not the case. And people, the Bible tells you, 
for people to take God's grace and for lasciviousness mm. and flip it to where now that you have this grace, or I said this unmerited favor of God, now you can uh, commit all the adultery, the fornication, worship all gods, you right. can steal. As long as you believe, mm. you're good. And you're going to make it to heaven. And I'm telling you, like, this, this grace... This grace doctrine is like it's a damnable heresy, along with not keeping the law, along with this prosperity. It's got people set up for the okie doke. Mm. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're supposed to be dead to sin, especially when you get that ba that baptism. You come up a new person. That old man is gone. You walk in newness of life. Of course, you're gonna make mistakes along the way, but you're not willingly sinning now at this point. So don't let nobody tell you, you know, grace is all grace gives you like that free pass. They're lying to you already. Right. Let's turn back to Second Corinthians chapter six. We'll finish that and then we'll go to our last scripture for the for the day. All right. Uh Second Corinthians chapter six and uh pick it up at verse seventeen. Right. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Second Corinthians. I'm sorry. Second <laughs> Corinthians seven. Uh, 17. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So, God is telling you, hey, bro, you gotta come out. Just like Abraham. He was in the, he was in the midst of all these people worshiping false God. He said, nah, bro, come here. I need you to go to this land instead. I need you to you know, I need you to dwell here. He separated Abraham from all that. Just like us. Yeah, we can't leave the world, but guess what? You know, we gotta keep on eye we gotta keep our mind or our eyes on the prize, which is the kingdom of God that's coming. And how do we do that? We gotta worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Which means we need to put aside this Easter. We gotta put aside this Good Friday. We gotta look on Passover, feast of love and bread, the real feast of the Lord. And it says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Mm -hmm. So you got to get out of this false doctrine, then the Lord will receive you. Because if you don't, don't want to remove yourself, the Lord don't want nothing to do with you. Because mm -hmm. guess what? He don't, he don't care about numbers. He'll take that one person who worships him over that thousand who worship him in vain. It's facts. That's why he had a lot leave Sodom and Gomorrah. That was one family. Think about that. The whole city. Fire and brimstone. But he saved Lot and his family. God don't care about numbers. He wants the true worshipers. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Praise the Lord. Let's go over to uh, Revelations. I want to say it's chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Because you got to make a choice, brothers and sisters. I don't know how you do that. Like, you, you just see. You go from here, 1 John chapter 5, a little bit of pages. You're ready at Revelation. Nah, you skip all of that. Revelations, I think it's 3. Yeah, Revelation chapter 3 will pick it up at verse 15. Alright. When you get there, go ahead and read it, please. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So God is saying, listen, I know what you do, bro. You can't hide nothing from God. And he says, you aren't even cold or hot. Not the tradition of men. You got anything to add on that, brother? No, that was it. You just said it, man. Like Joshua said, man, uh, you know, serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Right. But you got to make a choice, man. Right. Even though people are going to watch this video and ignore what we say, but they can't say they didn't know. Right. Shoot, even even, even when Joshua died, you brought that up, mm -hmm. Joshua 24, when he was talking, he's like, man, y'all got to make a choice, but as for me and my house, yeah. we're going to serve the Lord. Like, bro, you got to work out your own salvation. Mm -hmm. But you know what, bro? I'm a, then shoot, what you do, that's a, that's between you and the Lord. But hey, man, in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's right. We're going to keep the Passover that's coming up in two weeks. Mm -hmm. But I hope somebody got some understanding. You know, you know that? I'm good, man. In Jesus' name, peace. Peace.
Good stuff, man.